The Enemy Within, how an editorial explains the view that Democrats have of Trump voters right now. Plus, have you gotten used to all the normalcy around you? It doesn't look like Biden's going to keep that promise. And Chicago teachers may never go back to school. Plus, Fauci says two masks actually good. We'll get into that and more coming up. They promise you unity, and we all know that's not happening. But they also promise you normalcy. Now, the second one should be easier. The second one should be a more straightforward uh, ask and and a, a deliverable that they should be able to make happen. And it's not happening at all, as you know. If you want examples of this, just look at our nation's capital right now. It's it's absurd. It's beyond. Uh, crazy that they have enormous fencing and barbed wire and National Guard troops deployed all over D.C. Nothing happened on Biden's inauguration. Nothing has happened since then. Everyone is just going about their lives now, still under lockdown, still dealing with all these stupid policies. But we accept that this is what happened. Now, the Democrats never accepted that Trump really won. They used the media and their deep state operatives to pretend that there was a Russia collusion uh, narrative in 2016 for four years they pretended that and you can see now no all right we're in the biden era we we have made this transition but they haven't the biden voters and the democrat apparatus and the elites around them they have not made the transition to let's try to make things calm down a little bit let's let's try to be normal that was really a big selling point right they they were telling you all the time that donald trump was so evil and so disruptive and, and such, a, uh, such a volatile force in American politics that Joe Biden would, re- would return us to a semblance of normalcy. This is a word they used a lot. Do you feel all that normalcy now? Executive orders all over the place on far left issues. The Green New Deal now being pushed through. They're not calling it that, but they're just pushing Green New Deal policies with the executive branch, people losing their jobs, getting fired from them because of the lunatic belief that Democrats have. It's a religious belief for them that the world is going to end unless we take some blue collar workers and say you're not allowed to build a pipeline anymore. Yeah, that's really going to show them China and India are going to fall right in line any moment now, by the way. They're, they're going to do exactly what all the fancy bureaucrats in Europe tell them they should do about climate change. Sure, they are. But if you want an example of just how abnormal things are going to continue to be, as I mentioned, you can look at what's going on in D.C. You can look and see how it's prepared for an invasion any moment. Oh, another Trump coup, they're saying, look, this is getting very tiresome. It's a lie to say that what happened on January 6th was a coup. It was a riot. It was bad. It was dumb. There was no serious effort nor would any serious person say there was to overthrow the United States Congress, the United States government, and seize power. That's crazy. But it's a useful lie because it justifies then all the repressive measures we see. How can we talk about normalcy now in an era where big tech has decided that there are just some points of view you're not allowed to share about critical policy issues? I mean, there there are things that really matter right now and you can't talk about it unless you want to be deplatformed and remember we're not allowed to gather together so technology is increasingly our only mechanism of discussion certainly your only way to reach a a broad audience because we're not blm rioters we're not encouraged to go out in the streets in huge numbers while there's a pandemic going on no we wouldn't be allowed to do that so you're relying on big tech it's stay home and, and stick to the approved narrative. This is normal to people? And the journos are cheering this on. I mean, they, they are the biggest enemies of free speech in existence. They're the ones that we have to be the most concerned about right now. Because for them, it's both an ideological imperative to destroy their opponents, however they have to. It doesn't matter. They don't want there to be balance in the media ecosystem. They don't want conservative voices to have equal time or equal footing or any footing for that matter. And it's also a competitive advantage for them. They like this because they'll be making more money. Trust me, at CNN right now and and at at other 
is particularly for TV journalism, the absence of Trump as the great boogeyman. What, what do they have to tell you about? What do they have to say? Not very much. There are people who built entire careers on going on TV and calling Trump an evil monster, you know, doo-doo head. I mean, calling him all kinds of childish names. You know, that's what people actually built careers on in the news industry. Now what do they do? Well, what do they do? Oh, we don't know. They're still trying to figure it out. Oh, well, now they've had to create that animus, that rage that was directed at Trump. Normal has now become directing that at Trump voters, you see. We're all complicit. We're, we're all the ones that caused this situation, that caused this circumstance. And if you want an example of this, uh, there's one in the Washington Examiner. They published, now this is an opinion column, so this was on their op-ed page, How to Fix Our Domestic Terrorist Problem. Now, this is written by a fellow who's, uh, named, named Kevin Carroll, who uh, says here that he worked at, as a CIA and Army officer in Iraq and Afghanistan, counsel to the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, you know, this, this guy... Is, is trying to wave around these credentials so you'll think that he's not a moron. But I can tell you from reading his editorial, he's a moron. I don't care where he worked. I don't care where he served. I don't care what he did. He's not smart. Not smart. And as I've been telling you all along, I mean, the, the CIA brand is, is effectively now, it's, it's been turned into a big joke. I mean, the CIA is, is now laughable. I mean, how, how could it not be? You got people like John Brennan running the place. So you think that showing up and, and working for the CIA is going to impress anybody? Let me tell you, uh, I, I know firsthand it does not. Nobody cares anymore. But here's what this guy says. I mean, it, it, some of it is, is pretty standard. This got a lot of attention, though, because of just how crazy it is and that there's somebody who's clearly an institutionalist who's waving around his resume. Listen to me. I'm smart and I love my country and I worked hard and I did all these things. It does, but th that doesn't change the fact that the ideas are crazy. Right? There are plenty of people who have, a, have the things on their resume that we're all supposed to believe somehow makes them worth listening to, but that's not the case. I think we've all started to figure that out. Now, more than ever, these institutions that churn people out, they don't really mean anything. There are a lot of reasons they hire people, a lot of reasons they fire people, a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes into it that has nothing to do with merit. And here we go. First, he writes, bring the heaviest felony charge on as many participants in the insurrection. The insurrection, of course. It's not an insurrection, you jackass. Uh, I, and believe it can confidently convict. We ruthlessly hunted down foreign terrorists after September 11th and must do the same to their domestic equivalents. This guy's straight up comparing uh, people on Capitol Hill on January 6th to al-Qaeda terrorists who deploy suicide bombers into crowded markets, who drive planes full of, of civilians into buildings full of civilians and kill thousands of people in one day. This, this is what we, this is now what, what, are, what the intellectual class, supposedly, the intellectual class presents to you for what, how we're supposed to view what happened on January 6th. And I know that you could say, Buck, this is crazy. Who would really believe this? Democrats, whether they believe it or not, they're pretending that it's accurate. They're going to go forward and use this as a justification, which is what I told people as soon as this thing was happening. I said, this is a nightmare. And I had some very dumb conservatives come after me on that day and say, you don't understand how important it is that we speak out. No, 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 no. Now you see with the Kevin Carroll's of the world, with the barbed wire all over D.C., with the fencing up with the thousands of soldiers, you see how Democrats are exploiting a riot of idiocy, and now they're targeting you. They're targeting everybody. You step out of line, you get fired from your job. You say the wrong thing on social media, you get banned forever. You start talking to people about how you think there was fraud or you think there was whatever it may be. You know, they they want to sick the FBI on you. Oh, maybe you're one of those QAnon terrorists or something. This is what they're doing. They're telling you it right now how's all that normalcy feel so so we don't have unity that's for sure but can, could we have normalcy the answer is no we can't have normalcy either second this guy writes kevin Carr. i mean honestly the, the most the most 
astonishingly stupid editorial I've read in a very long time. And the Washington Examiner publishing it, part of me wants to get angry at them, but also, no, I think we should, we should understand how somebody who's supposed to have a, a resume that we respect and is impressive and everything could write something so dumb because this is a widespread belief among Democrats now. They really think that the January 6th riot was the, somehow the equivalent in some way of the September 11th attacks. They keep comparing them. Uh, second, make fire and police departments have their members sign commitments not to engage in acts to overthrow the government. This guy is a, it's, this guy's a moron. I mean, honestly, really, really stupid. But this is what he's writing. This guy was senior counsel. What is a senior counsel? The Secretary of Homeland Security? He's a jackass. Third, do not worry about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Ban extremist chatter through government censorship or private deplatforming and use radical chat rooms as honeypots so the, J- the FBI JTTF uh, has done, the same way that it's done against radical Islamists since 2001, we need to draw out our fellow citizens who are willing to attack our nation. Yeah, he wants surveillance on, on everybody who... What is it? Is a, is a Trump support? I mean, what are the what are the boundaries here? What are the limitations? And uh, it, it, it's insane. And, and he's all for deplatforming, of course, deplatform people, deplatform people like me for things like questioning why schools are shut down. Because that was that was against the consensus, right? That was against the I was right, though, and they were wrong. But maybe they should have deplatformed me for that, because that at one point in time was considered heretical. Fourth, use the supremacy of federal law to ban militias beyond the National Guard. There's simply no longer any room. I mean, honestly, man, this guy just spends way too much time watching Rachel Maddow. And fifth, add domestic terrorism as a predicate to the material support for terrorism statute, including its civil liability provisions. This is the line you really or the, the part you really need to know. Um. I woke up as a, oh, sorry. I woke up in my Manhattan apartment as a Wall Street law firm associate on September 12th, 2001, worrying about how we could stop the next attack. I woke up as a combat veteran in my suburban Washington, D.C. house on January 7th, 2021, equally worried. But I also remember what helped America last time. We defeated Al Qaeda and can do the same to the fascist thugs who attacked our democracy last month, but only if we take similarly hard measures against. The enemy within. Signed, Kevin Carroll, senior, former senior counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security and CIA officer. Um, drone strikes? I just want to know. Drone strikes against uh, the Chewbacca guy from the January 6th riot? What, what, what are we calling for here? What are we going to use? Are we going to waterboard your fellow Americans? What's, what's really the game plan here? I'm just just wondering, just putting this out there. And what about all the BLM riots? What about the attacks on federal buildings? What about the the assaults on police officers, the assassinations of police officers? All in the name of BLM and Antifa. What about that? Is that no, that's not covered under domestic terror. No, no, that's fine. That's actually just, you know, free expression of ideas. Now, people like Mr. Carroll are a cancer within the American commentariat. But they're representative of a much broader feeling. And you need to understand that this now is what they think is normal. Their hysteria, they're, oh my gosh, they're the Trump voters. Their hysteria is the dominant view on, among Democrats now about what they're up against with Trump voters and how there have to be extreme measures taken. And yeah, does this feel, does this feel normal to you? All the promises of the of the Biden administration fell apart within a week of him taking office. And when I mean the promises, I mean the 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 way it was all presented as things were going to go back. We're going to beat the pandemic. Things are going to go back to normal and all the Trump craziness would end. No, that's not what's happening at all. Now, the lunatics who relied on the Russia collusion narrative want payback and they're in power. And they want to treat you like a domestic terrorist if you say the wrong thing. This is what normal looks like now.
Well, I hope not, uh, Wolf, but it is conceivable that things could get a little worse. What we're starting to see, which is a good sign, is that we're starting to see a plateauing of the numbers of cases, which will always be followed by a diminution and a plateauing, and then ultimately a diminution of hospitalizations as well as deaths. But still, even if it plateaus and starts to come down, we're still at a very high, disturbing level. But hopefully, we'll continue to see a downtrend. I don't know why anyone listens to Dr. Fauci. If you're smart, if you're able to discern between things worth hearing and things not, you you would just ignore this guy at this point. It could get worse. It could get a little better than a little worse, then a little more worse, then a little more better. And I think people are understanding more and more that uh, the the truth of of, of this whole situation is that they're not going to let this go. They're not going to let us move on. This is not just going away. I don't just mean COVID in general. I, I mean their control, their desire to tell you what you can do. Here's the truth. You need to know now. You need to set your mind to it. And please go to BuckSexton.com. I've got a piece up on this right now. Don't ever forget that lockdowns have failed. And that a lot of powerful people owe millions of Americans an apology. Don't ever forget that. They want you to forget it. Uh, They're going to try to convince you that what they did was really smart and saved a lot of lives and everything. It's just not true. There's no way they can, there's no evidence they can present. There's no data to prove that these measures have worked. And let me be very clear, because I've I've had people reaching out to me and saying, well, what about, what about lockdowns in countries like Australia? Okay, let's take Australia, for example. First of all, I'm saying our lockdown didn't work. I'm not saying it's impossible. Yes, if you got everyone to stay home for an extended period of time, and you're an island nation with one twentieth the population of America, one 30th the population density of America and you were an island and could shut off global traffic easily maybe it maybe you'd have a shot with extreme measures to do what they said could be done in this country with lockdowns we had no shot of doing this and everybody knew it it was never going to happen too big too dense too many people coming and going and too many holes in the lockdown strategy Don't you see, they tell you lockdowns work. You say, well, how can it work when you still have, you know, people going to going to the store and going to big box stores and 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 congregating in private settings because they have to see other human beings. And, you know, there this wasn't actually ever a real lockdown. It was all the downside. Shut down the businesses, do annoying things that are are minimally minimally changing the trajectory for a short time, uh, the virus. 1% of cases in New York City for restaurants is what they said. And then leaving open all the main modes of transmission anyway. So what the CDC says right now, as you mentioned correctly, the most important thing is everybody should wear a mask. We don't have enough data yet, and the CDC will be collecting this as to whether or not two masks are going to be better than one mask. But, you know, if you use common sense and say, until we get the data, if a physical barrier with one mask works, it makes common sense that two layers or three layers, and you should have a double layer mask and one mask anyway. But if you want to put an extra mask on, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's no data to support it. But notice how he says not enough data. Last week he said no data. But now it's not enough because that leaves open the possibility that maybe there is some data, but he doesn't want to say. So now we're back to, you know, you want a double mask, double mask. Why not triple mask, Fouch? You know, people people say, oh, that don't don't be silly. Really? They're saying double mask now. And that was considered a silly point to bring up six months ago when people like me were saying they're going to tell you that. You started to see people that had the that had a mask and a visor on, you know, the the sort of the uh, the face shield plus a mask, maybe two masks and a face shield. And that that. Totally, totally normal behavior, right? I mean, we should all be expected to do these these insane things. 
Um, it's it's really troubling to see how how much uh, the American people have been willing to just be led like sheep around on this whole thing. Just ask the basic questions of people like Fauci. I I I, I love this because. I keep bringing it up knowing that nobody has a good answer for me. So we're okay with Fauci lying to the public because he thinks that we're, we can't be trusted with the truth because that's what he did initially about masks. We just, that's, that's a public health official. He lies to you. So, you know, if he, if, he, if he had said, guys, don't get the vaccine right now. We're not sure it's safe because they were running low on vaccine. Would that be okay? How would you feel if, you know, you had a, a loved one who was at high risk who waited on the vaccine because Fauci lied because he didn't want us to run out? That's what he did on masks. That is exactly what he did on masks. But no accountability for that whatsoever. Like I said, don't ever forget that lockdowns failed, that Fauci is a feckless bureaucrat. And if you go to BuckSexton.com right now, the main story there is an editorial I've written where I just, it's, it's quick, it's to the point, just says, look, look at the main argument. Look at the data here. And... The data tells a very clear story. They failed. They failed. We went through all this misery and all this stuff, all these lockdowns and businesses closed and and millions and millions of people's lives ruined. And for what? For what? Oh, well, they say it would have been worse. Yeah. That's a take a look at those numbers in January and December for places like California. California has been under a mask mandate for six, seven, eight months at that point. And, and where, where was the, the slowing of the spread that was supposed to? It was like wildfire all over California. But, you know, worked really well. That's what they'll tell you. Worked really well. Okay, fine. And we know that's not true. And here's the other problem. And this is, this is the part of it that I, I get into this at BuckSaxon.com in the editorial, is that they're going to drag this misery out as long as they can. Uh, no matter how many people get vaccinated and how low hospitalizations fall, there's a large segment of the Fauci worshipers that are going to demand masking and social distancing for the rest of 2021, at least, just to be safe. Just to be safe. <clears throat> and as we all know, that zero risk tolerance is, is completely is completely insane for society to have, but that's what we're being forced into. Um, and if you're wondering why I'm so confident that we're going to have to, we're going to have to start to come together and put pressure on politicians in different states to say, you can't keep locking people away from each other because a, a small percentage of the population, even with vaccines out there and everything else is still going to be at risk. You can't do it. It's not right. All right. This is the conversation. This is the adult conversation we should have been having from the beginning, but we weren't weren't willing to. There are people saying, you just want grandma and grandpa to die. All the demagoguery and stupidity and the incentives for creating a mass panic in the country because Donald Trump was president and they wanted to beat Donald Trump. If you make everybody miserable and terrified, it's a lot easier to convince them that they should do anything. They should support anyone other than whomever is in power at that point in time. And it worked. And it worked. Um, but how do I know they're going to continue to extend this? Well, here's, here's Fauci telling you that uh, even the, the vaccine, I'm sorry, even previous infection may not protect you against these new, the, the South African variant. Play 12. Well, the variants, for example, particularly the South African variants is, is obviously here. We know that there have been a couple of cases in South Carolina and one in Maryland. It is certainly not the dominant strain. But if it becomes dominant, the experience of our colleagues in South Africa indicate that even if you've been infected with the original virus, that there is a very high rate of reinfection to the point where previous infection does not seem to protect you against reinfection at least with the South African variant. So if there are variants of COVID for which naturally, naturally derived immunity from your immune system beating it, uh, you have no immunity going forward against, which is what he's suggesting here. What does that mean for the actual vaccines? Anybody want to take a guess? 
we either take our lives back or we let Fauci run the rest of your existence. That's what we're going to be faced with at some point. We either say enough is enough. We deal with the flu every year. We deal with, you know, life is imperfect. Um, there are risks. It's the way it is. At some point, we're going to get there. Or we have Fauci, you know, every, every three to six months, on TV, you know, we got another variant. Could be. I think we're going to have to do more mitigation and more, more measures, and uh, we don't have vaccine for everyone. And this is where it's all heading. This is what we've been seeing all along. That they keep moving the goalposts. They keep adding in the possibility. Oh, there's a possibility of something bad happening, and so therefore we all have to uh, act like we must listen again to the great Fauci and, and the rest of the people around him. Uh, the, you know, the, the disciples of Fauci, as I call them, who will listen to this guy no matter what he says. I mean, if Fauci said, you know, protect yourself with a plastic bag over your head and tie it real tight, you know, it might be hard to breathe, but it, but it will stop. You know, it's an impermeable barrier that will stop. Vib- a lot of people start putting plastic bags over their head, which is dangerous. Don't do that. But, you know, this is what people are going to do. If Dr. Fauci says it. Well, yeah, we have a society now where there's so much mass hysteria and, and just honestly so much institutionalized uh, fear and, and unwillingness to think for oneself and, and to come to basic conclusions about what you're seeing around you. And I, I've, it's, it's amazing to be all this, this, these hyper anxious people. Oh, my gosh, I saw somebody without a mask for a second. I'm so scared. What is wrong with them? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question. What's it? We, we've created this perception in society that, you know, if, if only we listen to the experts, you know, we're all going to die. Some of us understand that. Some of us have been in situations where we've thought before, I, I might actually die being here or dealing with this. Some of you listening have certainly been there. Whether it's from illness or being in combat or, or being in a you know, car crash or whatever it may be, you've experienced that thought of, I might actually die here. And we understand that you go through every day with a possibility that it could be your last. But time is, time is one thing you have. You'll never get back. And I just wonder how much of your life are you willing to spend in misery and isolation and separation from your fellow human beings because of the Fauci's of the world? And for those of you who are saying, oh, Buck, it's not that bad in my neighborhood. Yeah? You want to try to do some international travel these days? Want to go uh, you know, visit whatever, whatever country your ancestors are from? Good luck with that. There are all kinds of restrictions in place. And you don't think the Biden administration is coming up with more stuff that they want to do? More reasons for you to have to obey? They're moving on climate change stuff. They're acting like there's a climate emergency right now. They haven't even gotten checks. They haven't gotten a stimulus passed. They haven't done the things they've said they will do for the American people. None of that's happened, but they're worried about climate change. Oh, okay. So we, we could look at that and, and understand that these people are. Um, I, I can't say that they're, they're intellectually unserious, but as authoritarians, they're very serious about this. Um, they, they have all kinds of ways that we have to understand uh, they will continue to inflict themselves upon us. And finally, I think, though, now, because the, the results are in, You know, and I keep pointing out the Florida, New York, California comparison because the results are in people who are open minded and do think for themselves. Are going to realize they're on very firm ground to say the the Fauciites are jackasses. They were wrong. And we got to we got to stop listening to them. They have to stop being in charge of everyone. Well, well, John, if this isn't the siren song for my fellow New Yorkers, I, I don't know what is. And in my opinion, the governor needs to think about stepping aside. Look at the totality. We had this nursing home order expose uh, last week by the attorney general. The cover up was exposed. Now we have the evidence that he sidelined his own health department on the vaccine rollout in, in favor of the Greater New York Hospital Association, which, for those that don't know, is one of Albany's biggest lobbying groups, one of his biggest donor groups. And, and then again, the, the totality. 
brutality. All this, while whether it's uh, you know vaccines or deaths or the state's budget deficit, the economy, unemployment, this is a governor who has led the worst response in the United States of America. Uh, I think it's time for him to to really think about uh, you know heading down the thruway one final time. My friend Joe Borelli, who's a city councilman in New York, and you've heard on this show many times in the past, uh, just just speaking the truth about the governor of New York. And, and there's a reason. Look, look at the recall campaign against Gavin Newsom. Look at these Democrats in big states who now that people see what has happened, now that people are feeling the pain of the decisions that are made and how they didn't save them from COVID, they, they made everything worse. That, that's ultimately the assessment you should come to here, whether it's Gavin Newsom or Governor Cuomo, Governor Newsom or Cuomo, same thing. They, they made everything worse without any real benefit whatsoever. And they were smug. They were arrogant about all of it, too. But the MSNBC watchers out there were all clapping for it. Yeah, the science. Yeah, we believe in science. And then they want, you know, males to compete in female sports. And we'll see what happens there. What is even the justification for this? I never even they don't even bring it up. You're just it's just supposed to happen because equality or something. But back to the uh, the Cuomo saga, you had nine New York Times because there's so little Trump bashing to really do right now. They've got to do occasional journalism and they're also going to look for people to blame for some of this. They're going to have to throw some Democrats under the bus. That has to happen here. They have to sacrifice some Democrats to protect the rest of the Democrat Party narrative here that they were so good in dealing with COVID. You know, Biden's 100 days of masking was really, really smart. You got nine uh, top New York health officials, according to the New York Times, quit as Cuomo scorns expertise. When I say experts in air quotes, it sounds like I'm saying I don't really trust the experts, Governor Andrew Cuomo said of his pandemic policies, because I don't. Yeah. This is the guy who is holding... These uh, these sessions like the king bringing in everybody to his court to entertain him. Right. He's, oh, let me tell you what I'm doing today with the vaccine. We have charts. We're listening to science. We're going to do a great job. And if you don't listen to me, you want old people to die. That's Governor Cuomo. And this guy's a nightmare. Anybody who knows anything about New York politics uh, will tell you that Governor. I mean, that that Andrew Cuomo has a reputation for being thin skinned, vindictive, vicious. And basically just a really a bad person. He's a bad person. Okay, so you start with that. That's his reputation, broad reputation. Did you get any of that from Democrats back in April and May when he was holding those, you know, every day we're going to have a press conference, we're going to have a thing about, we're going to talk about the data, listen to me, it's about the data, the numbers. The people around him are, who are the actual, quote, expert on dealing with pandemic, uh, pandemic disease and other issues, those people have been fleeing from him because he overrides them because he is impossible to deal with and because uh, he's a nightmare basically. And remember the media made this guy into a hero. The media pretended that Cuomo was said, remember he was, he was maybe going to be the Democrat nominee for president at the last moment. But nine senior health, health officials have all left Cuomo because uh, he is terrible. And now with the New York State Attorney General, Leticia James, who, by the way, I think she's got the governor's chair in her sights. So this is, this is a twofer. This is great for her. Gets to look like the champion of the people here, the AG for New York State, and also maybe clear out a little, uh, clear out a little headroom, clear out a little space for the next move. Because Cuomo's nursing home order, as much as he's been trying to suppress this and fight it, was the single that that's the one decision you can point to from any leader in this country that seemed to have the single most direct effect on the spread of covid to the highest vulnerability populations, seniors in nursing homes. And resulted in we, we can't know the exact number, but resulted in a large number of people losing their lives because of Cuomo's stupidity. That's where we are. That's the truth. So we should all at least be willing to look at that and understand it for what it is. Um, but 
notice how things are starting to change now that we are, have more results, more time. The timeline has been extended, more data, more information. Democrats didn't have some great plan to handle this. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. It was all Trump's fault, right? It was all Trump's fault. Now that Trump's gone, everyone's looking around saying, wait a second. Why is anything better now? How is this an improvement over what we had before? While they're signing executive orders over the Green New Deal and basically, you know, kicking open the border. You got caravans making their way. They've got these executive orders on amnesty that are that are in progress right now. I mean, all this stuff. Oh, yeah, the, these these are the technocrats. These Democrats get stuff done. They're all about results. Yeah, if results means putting the government in charge of even more of your life and mainstreaming the worst kinds of incompetence like we saw from Cuomo, sure, those are results. Harsanyi time. It's our friend David Harsanyi from National Review. He's a senior writer at National Review. Does a lot of great pieces over there, and we're always appreciative to have him join us. David, good to see you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, I've been talking about normalcy today and how the new normal is apparently uh, treating your political opponents like members of the most vicious totalitarian terrorist organization of modern life, you know, Al Qaeda. It means signing a whole bunch of executive orders that are right in line with the far left wing agenda of the Democrat Party, the, the furthest left members, things like the Green New Deal, uh, and also results on covid where everyone looks around and says, hold on a second. So you guys, you Democrats didn't actually have some great plan here. They, they, they weren't the, the smartest people in the room ready to fix everything. What are you making of all this? Yeah, I mean, we learned quite quickly that Biden had no real uh, plan, you know, to to change the trajectory of uh, of covid. And in fact, he said, I have no plan to change the trajectory of covid in the next few months. He said that a few days ago. Meanwhile, when you look back at the campaign literature, he literally uses the word trajectory and how he was going to change it and how only Democrats can change it. So there is no plan. He tried to pretend that he had some sort of special vaccine distribution uh, you know, plan, which was the same as the Trump plan. Essentially, his plan is the Trump plan. He, there is nothing there that we haven't been doing other than him signing some executive orders that, you know, pressure governors to engage and to adopt mask wearing policies that almost all of them do, including in the one he signed on federal buildings. None of this is new. Um, obviously, Fauci is now talking about two masks and so on. But I mean, there's really nothing new here. So um, and as you mentioned, he's adopted all these far left wing ideas without any consensus, you know, joining the Paris Accords without going to the Senate, as Obama did. Um, he's ruling by fiat. And uh, that did not work out for Obama. He might have been personally popular, but he lost 900 seats. And if Biden goes this way, I think that the Republicans are going to have a good chance of winning back the Senate and the House. And we'll be back to where we were before Trump. I do think that there's a perhaps not necessarily a, a widespread buyer's remorse yet among among Democrats, but for any independents out there, for any people who are among the persuadables who believed because because I, I still think to this day that one of the the most potent narratives for Biden's for Biden's election win was that Donald Trump was it's not that Trump didn't do a great job leading us during covid but that he was actually somehow personally responsible for a large amount of the COVID deaths. This was the media story. I mean, they, they would say this. I played the clips on this show many times. Night after night, it was, you know, because of Trump's example, people are dying. Because of what Trump... And now we look all over the world, and this thing has just been devastating for whether it's countries in Europe, China, Brazil has had a horrible time with this. Countries all over the world of similar population and density have been crushed by this thing. So I guess it wasn't all Trump's fault, David. And, and I think that some people might just be waking up to that. Yeah, I mean, listen, Trump bears some responsibility in the way he handled it, because a lot of it, as we saw with Cuomo, with Andrew Cuomo, is how you present yourself, right? So Cuomo was the worst governor in, in the country. He he made the biggest mistake in coronavirus. And yet, you know, he was lauded, yet he wrote a book, yet he was on national TV, yet he, you know, won an Emmy. Uh, where Trump 
who I think did a better job than Cuomo in general, though there's only so much power the president has, was, you know, personally, I mean, Biden said he was personally responsible for these deaths, whereas the variation on, on fatality rates in Western countries is essentially, you know, they're, they're not the same, but they're in the same ballpark because of, you know, other, other forces. As you mentioned, no, uh, the, the, the virus doesn't care about if you're socialist, if you're socialized medicine, if you're free, if you're capitalistic society, it does not care. And the idea that we were going to somehow contain this in the way that they hoped uh, outside of trying to not overwhelm hospitals has been a joke, as we see with Sweden now, whose numbers are better than places like Belgium and, the U and basically the same as the UK, which has consistently had lockdowns and Sweden didn't have any, really. Right. Well, and, and I've, as I've been telling everybody, the, way, the whole debate has been set up in, in a way that's, that's, that's false because it's either a lockdown that's a real, I mean, a real lockdown is people cannot leave their homes for a period of time. You cannot, you know, you cannot go to other households. You have extreme limitations. They did this in Italy. They've done this in other places for a period of time where you, can, you can't leave town, you can't travel. And, and you can only go to the store to get food and you can you know, only go to the, the drugstore to get medicine. That's it. Right. That's we never really did that. So what we've had is, well, let's shut down restaurants and bars and some places. But all this other stuff, you know, people are still going in essential workers and grocery stores and big buy. That's all still happening. And so the virus is spreading in those places like we, we we've we've been led to believe that we were doing what other places that have had some success dealing with this, like uh, New Zealand and Australia, which are tiny islands with small, uh, far smaller populations. We never did really what they did. And we certainly never did it on a nationwide scale. And David, it's because we would have rejected it. No, no people wouldn't have said, yeah, sure. I'll, I'm going to stay in my apartment. I'm going to stay in my home for 30 or 60 days on pain of imprisonment. I don't, I don't think that would have flown here. No, I think initially when we were unsure of what was going on, it, it people were were scared for good reasons and they didn't know what was happening and they were willing to abide by rules like that on, you know, they're just being uh, yeah, look, asked I did. To do I, I was an ad I was all in favor of don't, not to interrupt you, David, but two weeks to let hospitals get ready for this thing and I was like, Okay, we can we can do that for two weeks. And that was that seemed reasonable. But what happened right. after I, that is we I know was, was very different. I was too. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I didn't know. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a medical expert. I don't know how to deal with this, but I am not also, you know, I'm not blind. Right. And after a year now, almost, I see the results and I can look at other countries and I can see how it's worked and hasn't worked. And I can see which states are, are doing well and which states aren't doing well. And you can compare New York and Florida and how they reacted to it. Now, obviously the, there's weather differences, there's, there's societal differences, but in the end, Florida has been better in every single quantifiable measure than New York, um, and they were far more permissive than New York, and they were and and they dealt with it better than New York. Now, I, I think that we should take lessons from that. But everything's been so politicized now, and there's no way back for a lot of people. They have to pretend that you know simple that mask wearing is some panacea. They have to pretend that we have to you know that we can never move forward again. I think it's dangerous. It's dangerous to civil liberties and it's dangerous to to actual science if you are a natural skeptic like I am. And I think that that's what people need to be when they're told stuff doesn't mean that they need to, um, you know, not believe the experts, but it needs to be there need to be questions and those questions need to be answered. And that hasn't happened. We have Fauci lying to us on multiple occasions, of, as we've discussed and others as well. And now we have Biden who lied to us through the entire campaign, saying he could change the trajectory, saying he could save us from the darkness or whatever, you know, over the top language he used. And none of that's true. None of that's true. It didn't matter if it was Biden or, or Trump, frankly. On this, and, uh, we're speaking you know, David, David Harsani, he's a senior writer at National Review. You can read his latest at nationalreview.com. You brought up uh, natural skepticism. And and I just think it's 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 troubling to watch how not only I think the media has always pretended, right, there, there's there are tensions with speaking truth to power. Well, it turns out if you actually want to advance your career in the media, a lot of the time you want to be a handmaiden of power. I mean, you, you know, you want to be close to the people that give you the interviews and give you the access. And that's a huge problem with political journalism it has been for a very long time. I think people might be more aware of it now, at least those with open eyes than they, than they were before. But just in general, the, the lack of skepticism from the press over over covid. And when it comes to experts, I mean, I, I sit around and I, I would be willing to have a debate with anybody about Fauci's 
mask pronouncements. Not I don't I'm not sitting around pretending like I understand the aerodynamics of virology through masks and whatever. But I know when someone says something that's BS, I know when someone lies to you or goes back on that. I do know as well as any scientist, any doctor, like they don't have some special uh, ability to to sift through that. In fact, I think I'm better at it than they are. And, you know, Fauci last week, it was. Two masks, and I know people say this is a small thing, but I don't think it's a small thing. It's two masks is clearly more effective. And then Osterholm comes out and says, well, actually, two masks are less effective than having just one mask. And then Fauci says, well, there's no data for two masks. So I guess maybe we can't say that. And now he's saying, well, there's no harm in two masks and there's some data and we'll look at more data. I mean, the guy's just he's just making it up as he goes along. That's obvious. And this is in the last week. That's one of the problems, just the more broadly speaking about, you know, follow the science. We will let science guide us. Two problems with that. First of all, there's no such thing. Science is constantly being challenged and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not some, you know, solid, immovable object. But B, I don't want to follow the science quite often because there are a million other trade-offs I have to think about. Sure, we could lock each other, we could lock down like the bubble boy, each of us, and never give a disease to anyone else. And we could all live happily ever after until we die of uh, lack of exercise or whatever it is. And But but the, the, the fact is, there are a million other things we need to think about. Fauci is not a constitutional scholar. What he says about uh, getting together in religious for religious services means zero to me because he has no say in that, even if there is a disease. And you know, we had the Hong Kong flu, and I, I just happened to read something, and they mentioned the Hong Kong flu. I think it was like 69 or something like that. 100,000 or more people died. We don't re really even know. And it was not, not even really that big an issue in the sense of, uh, you know, coverage, because this must have happened quite often. But not a single person ever thought that they would just be able to just give dictatorial powers, at least not from what I can tell, to governors to shut down the entire country. This is a completely new thing. And paired up with the illiberalism of many people on the left, it's become somewhat of a scary thing to me because they are taking power and no one pushes back. The only people who occasionally stop them are the courts. And the people, frankly, don't even seem to care very much in most places. So that, that I think, bodes poorly for our future in many ways for the pro-civil rights. And I think we're having a moment here where we can where there's a, there's a, a bit of an opening, David, because there's this recall effort against Gavin Newsom in California. There's this New York Times piece on nine senior health experts fleeing Governor Cuomo. Be, you know, it was really the states. The states have police power and they do have, uh, you know, essentially public health power. Right. The states in this country, that's those are realms of particular authority for them, even more so than the federal government. and. Uh, the, the, the results that you see from the states that took the most extreme positions are abysmal. And, and there's no arguing about this now. When you brought up Florida, I keep telling people because I'll get, you know, smug people on social media. Well, actually, if you look at, you know, this this 30 day window or that 60 day period, you know, New York was five percent lower for cases. Florida, I'm looking at them saying Florida is open. New York is shut down. People don't have I mean, people have lost thousands and thousands of businesses. Uh, their lives are ruined. And, and you're going to talk to me about a two or three percent temporary case reduction of, of, of something that I mean, it's just like no one thinks anymore, David. They're just we're like we've become a country of sheep. Yeah, this is what like Krug, Paul Krugman and others do. They'll pick a spot on the graph that works for them and then they'll ignore all the other times and spots, especially when it comes to places like Florida and Texas. Listen, in the end, New York has a 12 percent of their nursing home population died because of covid in Florida, which has a much bigger elderly population and is has more people in general. I think two more million more people than New York now had a under two percent fatality rate. That is not some small discrepancy. That's huge. It's 10 percent. And um you know, in every way, Florida handled it better. But people will say, look at this, you know, South Dakota is doing so poorly now. They haven't listened. But then you see a spike in New York and then they don't say anything. It's clear to me that, th that every time people pop out of their houses and want to get back into life, this spreads again. I hope the vaccine helps us, uh, uh, you know, alleviate this and that we can move forward. But we need to move forward no matter what happens in the end. We just have to try to I, you protect know, certain say populations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I often say that hypocrisy is a is a defining or a, a foundational characteristic of being a Democrat in, in America today. But I would just add one on to this. I, I wanted your your sense, your your reaction to this. 
I do also think that there is a a kind of political, cultural, intellectual arrogance that comes along with being a, like they, this is with the whole, oh, I believe science thing that people who don't read anything, never mind scientific journals, who, who really are, are deeply ignorant. But, you know, they they kind of they, they checked a, a few boxes on went to a certain kind of school or something. They really do believe that they're smarter. And then all these people, Joe Biden, and the people around him are so much smarter. It's just not true. Yeah, you know, I, uh, you know, I've been uh, in journalism for a while. And when you start out, you know, you're, 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 you're in awe of certain people, you, you know, you think about certain institutions in a way, uh, you, you admire them, whatever it is, and then you're in them. And you're like, man, these people aren't as smart as I thought, right? <laughs> these people are no smarter than me, most of them. And that's, you know, now, we're, you know, we're, we're in the middle somewhere of the intellectual spectrum, right? So, um, and then Twitter comes around and then you realize, oh my God, a lot of people who run things are just idiots. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm not calling him an idiot exactly, but Andy Slavitt, who is now like the senior advisor on COVID, has tweets out saying that Cuomo what, had handled COVID better than anyone in the country, that he is basically a genius, that he never took credit, that he, that he, you know, he did everything correct. And now you're like, their fatality rate is second highest to New Jersey in the country. Everything is terrible. And he does not pay a pri- price for that or anything. He is, in fact, rewarded for that. So I don't know how we can keep going this way when everyone, no one trusts institutions like journalism, which is completely corrupt these days, frankly. And, uh, and you know, I don't know how you go forward, but what Twitter has done and what social media has done is shown us that these people are not any smarter than an average person. Maybe they have different expertise, et cetera. But as far as just living life and common sense and going about their daily business, these people live in the clouds often and they have all the power. And one last thing on this, you know, I often argue with folks who think that big tech is the main problem and big businesses. And I completely sympathize with many of their uh, you know, their their thoughts. But they don't have guns. They don't have laws. They, it's very difficult for them to put you out of business, to shut you down, to keep you at home, to not let you go worship. Government can still do all those things. And they did during COVID. And there was no pushback. And they, and they did whatever they wanted. And that, should, that, that, again, to me, is something that I'm, I'm really nervous about moving forward. Because as you say, they talk now like this is a forever problem. Like 10 years from now, it's not going to be normal. My kids are going to have to wear double masks just to go outside. I mean, I don't want that kind of world. You've mentioned it before. It's dehumanizing, but it's also an infringement on on people's individual rights. So I'm a little worried about that, uh, but we'll see. I think there is a backlash coming because of Biden's sort of, you know, ruling by fiat and pen. And I don't think people are going to like that. And also people are realizing Joe Biden... No surprise to anybody who is smart. Joe Biden's not that smart, folks. Okay, he's Come actually, on, he's actually not dumb. smarter yeah. than Trump. I know we were all told that. It's it's not true. You know, so Joe we'll, we'll you get know, to that another about day. Joe Biden is like he's some old man who's lost his bearings, and he has to some extent. Don't get me wrong; he's incoherent quite often. But he's been this way. I'm an old, yeah, you know, I'm 51 years old now, and I've seen him for a long time, and he's never been coherent, right? And he's always been kind of a goofball, and it's hard to believe he's actually president. Now, obviously, you know, Trump made a lot of mistakes, et cetera, but uh, th- these were not and you say buyer's remorse. But, yeah, you know, that may that that kind of buyer's remorse really shows itself in midterms. So that's what, you know, I for him, yeah, that's where we got to focus. Big that's where we got to focus. We got to stop yeah. these Democrats from being crazy. National Review dot com for David Harsanyi's latest. David, as always, thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. 